This clip provides an introduction to autocorrelation and common issue in regression analysis. Let's first start with our usual regression model y equals x per liter plus u. So let's just specify what these matrices looks, look like. We have a little subscript t here in the variables to indicate we're having time series data and that means the order of the variables matters. The first column of x is a vector of ones to indicate a constant and then we have a beta coefficient vector. That's actually a small mistake but I'll correct it in a minute. And a vector of error terms. Now this vector of error terms, this is a random vector. That's important now. And we'll deal with this vector of u. Now let's look at the uh, dimensions. That's u is t by 1, y is t by 1, x is that's denoted as t by k but then right now we have k plus 1 column so what I'll do is I'll change that x1 to x2 and then we have actually k columns here and then beta is k by 1 so now everything is correct. Now that random vector u the properties of this are now important. The expected value is 0 uh, as usual for our error terms. Now the variance uh, of u, that's a t by t matrix, and we call that capital omega, or big omega. Now it's the structure of this omega that will drive a lot of the issues that arise. So first recall that if the gauss markov assumptions hold, then this omega can be decomposed into sigma squared times the identity matrix, that means the omega looks like this. Okay, very easy, just with sigmas on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else. In general, however, that omega will look somewhat differently. So, not making that assumption that the Gauss-Markov assumption sold, our omega will have, let's start with the diagonal, the V stands for variance, the variance of U1, variance of U2, variance of U3, all the way up to the last observation, variance of UT. And here on the off di diagonal, we have the covariance of U1 and U2, covariance U1 and U3. So that C U1 U2 or UT US in general means the covariance between UT and US. So uh, that's what we find on these di off diagonal terms, these covariances. And let's specify a few at the bottom. The last ones are covariance of UT and UT minus 1. We have a symmetric variance covariance matrix. So that's why everything here is symmetric. Okay, so that's important to understand that in general our variance covariance matrix indicates this. Let me write this in a different way. On the diagonal we have the variances. On the first off diagonal we have the covariances of lag 1 on both sides above and below the variances. On the second off diagonal we have covariances of lag 2 and then lag 3 and so forth. And the last one in the corner is going to be covariance with lag t minus 1. Okay, so that's the structure of any general variance covariance matrix. Nothing that's just extremely general and we call that hash and we'll get back to this. In the case where we have heteroscedasticity, we know that this omega simplifies, simplifies to the variances for the different potentially different variances for error terms on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Now you may have seen before instead of that terminology v u1, v u2, we used before sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, but that's just a notational difference. Uh, the meaning is exactly the same. So that was important this omega because from this structure we actually figured out how to perform robust inference. Oh, it wasn't us, it was Herbert White who did, but we learned what he proposed. And this structure was also important to figure out how we perform weighted least squares, which was the particular form of GLS which we used to find efficient estimators. So what about autocorrelation? We haven't really talked about it yet. Now, 
autocorrelation in the arrow vector u constitutes a breach of time series assumption 5. Recall time series assumption 5 related to the covariance between ut and ut minus s conditional on the axis but we'll possibly ignore that for most of this clip and that was unequal to zero. What does that mean? It means that all these red bits here in our generic variance covariance matrix that these guys don't fall away to zero. So therefore the omega is again going to be unequal to sigma squared times the identity matrix. And that means all the consequences we discussed about the heteroscedastic case are valid here as well. Beta hat all s is not efficient, not the best estimator. And secondly, our standard variance formula for beta hat doesn't work and that had consequences for inference. And that mean that meant we had to devise some different formula for the variance of beta hat. So here we have the same consequences. What we need to do is we need to figure out the structure of this omega such that we can devise ways to tackle these two issues. Right? So devise a way to, to figure out how to perform GLS to get efficient estimators of beta. And secondly, to uh, demonstrate how we can perform robust inference or sometimes we say inference that is robust to autocorrelation, AC for autocorrelation. In this clip we'll deal with the robust inference but we will not discuss how to do GLS. Turns out for autocorrelation this is quite complicated and very specific to special cases. So what's the structure of the omega if you have autocorrelated arrow terms? Question we've got to ask ourselves, do we know a process that can generate non-zero autocorrelations and therefore autocovariances? And the answer is yes. We talked about autoregressive processes. So what we do here is that for the time being we will assume, and that's why it's red, okay, we assume that UT follows an AR1 process. And of course that's a special case. Let's state the AR1 process. We use a constant of zero, y should be obvious in a moment, plus rho times ut minus one plus epsilon t. This epsilon t is a new error term and that is iid with zero mean and a constant variance sigma squared epsilon. Now how does that omega look like for this special case? This is now the question we want to answer. Now from the time series chapter we know that if we have our AR1 process described above, the expected value for ut is zero, constant divided by one minus rho in the variance, let's label that sigma squared, that's the variance for u as opposed to the variance for epsilon, which is sigma squared epsilon. The variance for u is the variance of epsilon divided by one minus rho squared, the AR1 coefficient squared. You have also learned that the first order autocorrelation is just rho in an AR1. The second order autocorrelation is rho squared and so forth. Now all of this, and it's important to stress that again, is really specific to the AR1. Now if we know the correlations, we know the covariances, they're just the correlations times the variance and that's the variance of u and that is here, that's the sigma squared. So co first order autocovariance is rho times sigma squared, second order is rho squared times sigma squared and if we need any higher order, let's say the order k, covariance between ut and t minus k is rho to the k times sigma squared. We will now use this information to go back to our generic form of omega in the hash equation. That's the one on the right up here and we'll copy that down and now we're going to fill this with life, our special case. Because we now have established all the information we need. So here's our big general omega. On the diagonal we have the variances. And we label that here the variances of the ut, which is the sigma squares. So let me write this. Let's see how I can write that in a sensible way. Sigma squared, we have that value everywhere on the diagonal. 
that's what this line indicates okay we have that everywhere now what about in the first off diagonals we need the covariance of flag one and that's this value rho times sigma squared so here we have rho times sigma squared and that's everywhere on the first off diagonal on the lower and upper first off diagonal then we need the covariance with flag two and that's this term rho squared times sigma squared on the upper and lower of diagonal okay and again that's everywhere here and so forth so we can go all the way into the corner with this and should be obvious we always have increased and increased lag the you can see everywhere in here we have a sigma squared so therefore we can somewhat simplify that by taking out that sigma squared which is a scalar uh, we assume Thomas Galasticity, I'll point that out in a minute again so that means on the diagonal we just have ones because we have one times sigma square everywhere first off diagonal is rho second off diagonal is rho squared and so forth okay all the way down second off diagonal and in the corner let's briefly think what we have here rho to the power of t minus one because that's the difference lag between the first and the teeth observation and that's what we have in these corners the top right and bottom left corners the covariance between u1 and ut so note a couple of things here this is really the simplest version of an autocorrelated error term Okay. in two ways we assumed no heteroscedasticity that's why we have constant variances everywhere and we used a special case of an AR1 process for the error term we learned that we have we can have more complicated AR processes and then this would look much more complicated however this is enough for us to understand the basis on which we will design robust inference in the case of autocorrelations.